I've always had a fascination for the paranormal, investigating ghost stories and urban legends since I was a kid. If I ever heard a story that included the words, they say if you go there at midnight, then I was there at midnight, waiting for a genuine encounter. In hindsight, I wish that I hadn't. If you chase a shadow long enough, you're bound to find the caster. Trust me when I say this. You don't want to know. Yeah, I know that's how these stories usually begin. Please don't read this, or I don't care if you believe me. It piques your curiosity, keeps you reading, keeps you guessing. Well, I'm warning you now. I want you to listen. Carefully. You don't want to know. Keep your tails precarious. Stay behind your computer monitor where it's safe. You're better off wondering and guessing. Because curiosity without discretion is a dangerous thing. I'm going to tell you I learned it the hard way. And I hope it'll keep the most of you from meddling too much for your own good. You don't want to find yourself living like me. I'm not even sure if I can call it living anymore. I only hope I can finish this in time because most of the time I have these days doesn't belong to me. There have been many, there have been so many myths of tales, gods, demons and spirits and creatures of worlds beyond our own. The old stories change over time and beliefs change with them, yet somehow mankind has always feared and worshipped the same things. Psychologists see it as a need for closure. They say we fear the unknown and we would accept anything to make sense of the world even if it means believing in a total fabrication. Everything has a rational explanation, right? We live in a secular age, so that's the assumption. Then again, they also say where there is smoke, there is fire. When I heard and read all these stories, I came to question what society had told me. Could they all really be the superstitions of ignorant primitives inspired by firelight, paranoia, and my alternating substances? Or these truly things to be feared, even before the songs and legends. That's what I wanted to find out, so I buried my nose in mythology, books, and ghost stories. It kept my ear to the ground for urban legends. I explored them all, or, well, all the local ones anyway. I tested everything from the, the ghost ship of the Hudson River to the infamous Bloody Mary. Every search was a disappointment, but it never discouraged me. It was a great hobby, and I still went through the motions just for the thrill. As I had come to expect, I never exactly struck gold. That is, until the blackout. At 3rd in Maine. It was a night before spring break after a long and grueling semester. Most of the other students migrated to Manhattan for large, obnoxious parties. My small group of friends and I, on the other hand, prefer peace and quiet. Apparently, peace and quiet on that particular night meant a trip to a lively Irish pub called Piper's Kilt. So, don't ask me what the hell we were thinking, I couldn't tell you. That's where I met a drunken old immigrant by the name of Tom. Tom was a strange man, which made the conversation all the more interesting, even if we did have to shout over some surprisingly upbeat song about a sinking ship over the customary pint of Guinness. I told him about my little hobby, and he told me a story that I now wished I never heard. He said that Irish tradition runs far deeper than its Catholic years, and he told me about the long-held cultic legends of the Fae. He told me of the Banshee, the Morian Giants, and of Leprechauns. To that last one, he added, I'll have you know they're not the little people you've been told of, Sonny Jim. <laughs> Aside from the conversation, the, the audience participation folk songs uh, tend to grow on you once you're good and buzzed, and we stayed longer than I expected. After a few more rounds, the night ended just as one would expect. Sobering visit to a terrible diner with terrible coffee. A dear friend, a dear friend also made it a point to get hammered beyond the point of no return, and had to drive him home so he wouldn't end up parking his car in someone else's living room. I slept on the couch with the intent of taking him to pick up his car in the morning, provided they didn't wind up in a coma. I had been a hypocrite to look down on him, though. He had done the same for me in the past twice. So, after helping him up to his bedroom, nearly breaking my back in the process, I retired to the couch. I passed out after four episodes of an I Love Lucy marathon and a couple of annoying infomercials. Ordinarily, after a murdy helping of alcohol, it wouldn't take me so long to find sleep. 
That, however, was when I was in my own bed. Never slept well in strange places. Plus, I still had the spirited racket of the old dun cow running through my head, along with old Tom's fascinating stories. I wish those waking hours would have lasted. They are the last normal memories I have. The last memories that I can confidently call my own. A few hours later, well until the hangover I had earned, I woke up to a dark house. Every standby light for every electronic device turned black, including the clocks. I peered through the window behind me, lifting one of the blinds and stared out across the street. Every porch light had died at some point in the night, and I couldn't see much of anything. I figured a storm must have rolled in overhead and killed the power on the block. I slept through louder things on night like this, after all, and I was ready to write it off and go back to sleep. But then I looked at my watch. The second hand ticked just past midnight and slowed to a stop. Old Tom's final story came to mind. The old believers call him the Black Gambler, he told me. Tempter and trickster of the faithful. The greedy for wealth and power bartered him with their souls, called him on the darkest midnight hour, and as he came as a dark man at the crossroads. It could have been a coincidence, sure. Most people would have just ignored it. I, however, had a tendency to dismiss reason and frame a whimsy. It came with the it came with the territory. If ever there was a time to test the myth, I wouldn't have found one better. Of course, I had no expectations, as usual. I would take a five minutes of my time to humor the old man, take another two or three to take a much-needed leak, then head back to bed. With that plan in mind, I stepped through the front door, myth of the night. My first thought was that my previous assumption was wrong. I could smell no rainfall, could feel no moisture in the air, and there were no puddles or wet spots. There had been no storm. It didn't stir me, though blackouts can have other causes. More concerning was the darkness and silence. It felt foreboding and wrong, but I dismissed it like everything else. I was just allowing my mind to play tricks on me, that was all. Just letting myself feel the fear that I was supposed to feel, and the feeling subsided a bit when I saw the starlight overhead. That's the meeting place, he told me. Crossroads represent choice and consequence, and that's where you find them. If he hears your call. So, minding my step in the dark, I approached the nearest intersection to my wasted friend's front porch and I glanced at the street sign as I stood at the curb, third and main. I stared at it for a moment before fishing in my jacket pocket for the next step. If you wish an audience with a black gambler, you must dig a shallow hole in your nearest corner. In that hole, bury a single key. That is the ticket to the space between our world and theirs. The space where he can see you, and he may allow you to see him. Somehow, when I followed Tom's story, I imagined an old dirt road in an open field. I imagined an old antique key. Everything you might suspect will open a dungeon or an old cellar. It felt ridiculous to make do with what I had on hand, and I hoped this fey person wouldn't be too particular. Fortunately, I had a collection of useless, cle useless keys that could have impressed a janitor. I pulled up my key ring, then... Like that, a forgotten old thing that probably opened a padlock I've lost. Part of its silver coating pulled away from the copper base. I removed a hefty clump of my dear friend's front lawn and placed it beneath, then went on the soil and patted it in. The job wasn't neat, but Duddy would have cared. He wasn't exactly a proud gardener. Once that key is in the earth, you have opened the door between our world and theirs. Only mortals with dire purpose venture to the land between. So be careful and be sure. Be sure you're ready, lad. And don't step in the road until you are. Well, with a deep sarcastic breath, I assured myself that I was ready and took my first step out on the road. Heading into the center of the intersection. I stood there waiting with my required cynical streak for five minutes. Five minutes became ten minutes. 10 minutes became 20 minutes. 20 minutes became a week, which became 30 seconds, 2 days, 5 months, an hour, 20 years. An instant in an eternity. Before I knew what was happening, my sense of time slipped away as I spiraled into a sudden, seemingly endless nightmare. At that moment of that timeless hell, the trance over me subsided, 
and I became aware of my surroundings again. This was the land between. I expected it to be a state of mind, some exaggeration of an old druid's med meditation, but it was real. That is, if real is an accurate word to describe it. It was like any other place on earth. Unlike anything I had ever felt. It's hard to explain to someone who's never set foot there, but I'll try. At first glance, it looks just like the same it does as our world. It has the same structure, the same colors, but you know something isn't right. That world is too still, like a rigor mortis snapshot of something that should be alive. There's no wind, no breath of life. It's a world not meant for us. You come into it deaf and numb. You feel no heat or cold against your sin. You don't feel the ground beneath your feet, not even the movements of your own body. It's like an unending tomb, a world of stone. Where you feel nothing and float aimlessly in complete silence. Listen for a voice lad. That's him talking. You know when you hear it. He sees you. That's when your test begins. Of course, I I know it when I heard it. It would be the only thing I could possibly hear, and sure enough, I did. It was faint, almost not there at all, but I heard it. Under all, any other circumstances, I doubt I would have called it a voice. No human lips were forming those syllables, and that deep groan was not a sound from human vocal cords. Nevertheless, he was speaking to me. I can't tell you what it said, if anything at all. It was just an acknowledgement of some sort, maybe even a green. It terrified me. You will first meet with a great beast, a thing of nightmares. He'll know you better than you know yourself. You will face it, and you will face all your fears, all the things that ever struck your heart cold, all the things that have haunted your dreams. But don't run, he warned me. You must not run. To do so will break the right, and to break the right is to insult the gambler. You won't want to insult him, Sonny Jim. I can promise you that. The thing approached, and I felt its rumbling steps beneath my feet. Whatever robbed me of my senses began to return them ever so slowly, or perhaps they returned on their own out of some overpowering and sin instinctive necessity. Whatever the case, I will receive the beast with every primal sense fully alert. It emerged from the darkness down the road, a colossal mountain of fur and muscle towering over the dead street lamps, its grotesque form veiled in a silhouette. It seemed all at once as a giant wildcat, a hulking bull and a monstrous bear. It towered its face less than two feet from mine. It growled and huffed, its breath like a hot sandstorm stinging my face. I found myself in its eyes. I saw myself as it saw me. That is where the true terror began. Oh, Tom was right. I did face all my fears, every single one of them. The fear of death, the fear of heights, of drowning, the fear of losing my job or of dying alone. The fear of accomplishing nothing in my life. The fear of the pressure and responsibility of leadership. The fear of my creepy neighbor across the hall, the fear of lightning storms, and of the dark. Even my childhood fears, once funny in hindsight, came crawling back. The fear of seeing my grandmother first time without her dentures. The fear of the monster in my closet. The fear of large dogs. The fear of the school bully. And the fear I once felt when I was separated from my mother in a crowded hall. You'll be watching if you pass the test, because most don't. It'll take an interest in you. It'll come to you as a man in a dark cloak, and it'll ask you a question. A choice that only one you can make. I didn't run, but it wasn't out of bravery. It was because I was frozen in fear, my legs quaking beneath me, in genuine tears I hadn't spilled since I was a kid. I no longer needed to take the leak I had planned for. I stood there for another eternity, failing to catch my breath for much of it. And I saw him standing at a corner, staring at me. He wasn't a man in a dark cloak. He wasn't really a man at all. The tales twist over time through poetic embellishment and mistranslation, so you, you never hear what you hear is never completely truthful. Then again, nothing the storyteller could spin could prepare you for the reality of these things. They are simply no words to describe them. Even I am likely misleading you now, though I am trying to be as literal as possible. 
Most cultures have stories about him. And the way most describe him is honestly the most accurate way possible. He's a dark man at the crossroads. At all crossroads. And all crossroads belong to him. He didn't move at first. Instead, he spoke to me. And his voice was a soft breeze on the stillness. A wordless whisper. He did offer me a choice. Though it wasn't a question. It was simply a curiosity for my will and true desire. If I truly wished for what was to come. My answer came in spite of me. And the answer was yes. Yes, I would commit a sacrifice for his gift. Yes, a higher purpose mattered more than my life. And yes, I would do what required of me of these, for these things. He approached me, and I felt a biting chill blow past me as he neared. The closer he came, the less distinct he appeared. His shape wasn't that of a man, but that of a man's shadow suspended in the air, nebulous and immaterial. In brief moments, I could see the vague suggestions of a face but never enough to read his expression he stood motionless before me for several minutes and then extended to me one intangible hand present the gambler with the possession of yours an item of personal importance he will turn over in his hands at a time understanding its meaning to you and you will return it to you along with a gift i had nothing in particular value on me at the time let alone of personal value I have felt in my pocket till I came upon my old Zippo lighter. An old girlfriend passed it on to me once he decided to quit smoking. But the thing was, she picked the habit back up after the stress of the breakup, and she wanted it back. Perhaps for an immature laugh, I decided to hang on to it. That was about the extent of its meaning to me. I didn't love it, but I liked it, and I hoped that it would be enough. He did just as old Thomas said. I swear I saw a smile on those vague moments of his face. In those last minutes, he didn't just examine that lighter. He judged my value, because this was not really a gift. It was an exchange. And after he was certain of his investment, he would turn the lighter to me. As he placed the lighter back in my hand, the moment it touched my skin, the world went black. It was in that last instance of caution, consciousness that I wish I had taken Tom's final word seriously. He will return it to you along with a gift in exchange for seven years' service. He always collects, so be sure this is what you want, lad. Be sure that it's worth it. Because your life belongs to him now. Since then, my life has been one of hazy nightmares, amnesia, and moments of clarity. I've gone to sleep at night, waking some days later in the sewer tunnel completely naked and holding mysterious, still warm, bloody masses in my hands. I have blacked out in mid-conversation, waking up to see television news report about a massive fire and the arsonist fit my description. I have faint memories of places I don't recognize, people I've never met in places that shouldn't exist. I have torrential dreams of the land between, standing at my master's side like a pet on a leash. Next time I saw Jack, the friend I drove home that night, it was at the doorstep of his family home with his wife and two children. He looked well, even fit. When I knew him, he was a sloppy, overweight bachelor and had bad luck with women. He also wore a ponytail in those days. Now he was bald. He hadn't. He said he had seen me in years, that everyone assumed I was dead. I begged for his help. The next thing I knew, I woke in a dark alley somewhere. I was covered in bruises and cuts. I was holding Jack's bloodied wallet in my right hand. I, I didn't know how long it had been. But I had a terrible realization. When it said that he would demand seven years of service, it didn't mean seven years from that night. It meant seven years in total. I am a slave and I can be spirited away at any moment. Sometimes I'll be fine for months at a time. Sometimes I'll have my life back on track, assuming that the nightmare is over. But he always calls for me again. I haven't even had the time to learn of what gift he has given me. And like many before me, I am ensnared in his web. And until my debt is paid in full, I am his unwitting puppet. I may never be free. This is the last time I will say it. Stay behind your computer, mo computer monitor where it's safe. You don't want to know. 
it's just not worth it. Convince yourselves that these things aren't true and keep your curiosity in check. Force yourself to lose interest and find a new hobby if you can. If not for your sake, then for mine. I've already found the blood of too many mailers on my hands as it is. <laughs>